Great. Thank you so much, Anna, for the kind introduction. I am so pleased to be here today to talk about our brief on adolescent focused approaches, uh, which Anna said is, is an important area for both intervention and for research within violence prevention programming. Um, adolescence, as all of us know, it is a critical life stage um, at which girls are likely to face new gender risks. Uh, but although it is a time when girls are more vulnerable to certain forms of violence, it's also a promising entry point for early prevention efforts. There's now plenty of evidence that reducing risks and enhancing protective factors of both victimization and perpetration can actually help to transform social norms and patterns of behavior around gender violence, which can then help to break the cycle of violence. However, um, researchers and practitioners recognize that there are still evidence gaps um, when it comes to this kind of programming. Uh, for one, the specific needs and vulnerabilities of adolescent girls are still largely invisible and falling through the cracks um, in the development of policies and programs to end violence against children on one hand and violence against women on the other. Uh, two, there are concerns that interventions that explicitly focus on adolescents um, uh, do not adopt a, that much needed gender transformative lens. Um, and that if they do, it often comes at the cost of, of inadvertently excluding adolescent boys. And third, there seems to be a strong need to sort of identify entry points and innovative approaches to, to enable adolescent girls to actually access uh, prevention and response services, especially girls at risk. In short, there is a gap in terms of documenting the sort of hows and whys of, 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 of these approaches. And this brief really tries to fill that gap and, and brings together a wealth of practice-based knowledge from our grantee organizations from 10 different countries. Um, as you can see on the screen, these projects were carried out by a range of, of, of uh, civil society organization types. Um, there's women's organizations, there's youth organizations, girl-led organizations. Um, they've all worked on several different forms of violence, um, including menstrual stigma in, in Nepal, uh, female genital mutilation in Tanzania, dating violence in South Africa, violence against specific groups of girls such as ethnic minorities in, in Serbia or girls with disabilities in the state of Palestine. Um, I just want to take a minute to read out all their names because uh, they were absolutely central in co-producing this paper. So we had uh, Grassroots Soccer from South Africa, Autonomous Women's Center from Serbia, both of who are here today on the panel, so you'll hear from them shortly as well. Uh, Restless Development from Nepal, um, Mongolian Women's Fund, the Ukrainian Women's Fund, Amrif Tanzania, uh, Women's Study Center from the State of Palestine, Abdel from Cameroon, APL from El, El Salvador, and Plan International from Vietnam. So thanks so much to all of you for participating. And the goal of this brief really was to was to was that through focus group discussions with these practitioners through a content analysis of their monitoring and evaluation reports, um, this brief really elevates a set of themes that seem to be most relevant for all practitioners um, on the nuts and bolts of working on adolescent focused approaches. And there's five themes that really sort of rose to the top. Um, and these are the five themes that you sort of see on the screen. Uh, one is on how to anchor uh, prevention interventions in, in girls perceptions of safety, how to tailor trainings to ensure that they are diverse, age appropriate and intensive, um, how to mobilize agents of change among and around adolescent girls, how to design prevention programs where there's an absence of adolescent friendly services, and how to promote gender transformative strategies to, uh, uh, to these approaches. So in the actual brief, each of these um, themes is structured in a way that there is a conversation between the practitioners insights um, and what the literature is saying on the same. Uh, but for today's presentation, in the interest of time, I'll only be going over the headlines and really sort of focus on the practitioners insights uh, piece of it. But we do encourage you to take a look at the long version of the report. So diving straight into that, that very first um, finding, 
all practitioners agreed that that adolescent girls' perception of safety was often the starting point for the intervention, especially in so many places in the absence of prevalence data for the specific target age group that, that uh, practitioners were working on or in the specific region that they were working on. Practitioners reported that, that girls experience a heightened lack of safety, um, even in spaces that are designed to be adolescent friendly, um, parks, playing fields, online forums for young people, which uh, practitioners are finding are still largely dominated uh, by boys at that age. So that initial analysis of perceptions of safety can really help to inform several aspects of prevention programming and determine exactly which spaces and entry points to really prioritize, whether to do a safe schools program, whether to do a parenting intervention, um, you know, community level intervention or legal uh, policy level work or some combination thereof. One common finding was that given that heightened sense of sort of lack of safety that girls feel in most spaces they occupy, all 10 projects seem to want to work on twin tracks. So carving out girls only spaces, but also recognizing that existing public and private spaces are gendered and incrementally trying to work to reclaim those spaces for, for adolescent girls. Uh, the second finding and, and, and a bunch of the uh, a, a majority of the practice-based knowledge was really around this topic, which was the design of training methodologies, also something that Radhika spoke about extensively and you heard from uh, in our previous panel. But in this specific case, just working to make sure that these are age appropriate, even within that age range, or even within a specific age group, um, that they are diverse, that they're intensive, and that they go beyond one-off sessions. Um, constant adaptation throughout the project was seen as really important to meet girls where they are, um, and taking into account their sort of immediate circumstances, their ages, their schedules, safe spaces, etc., which can change even during the duration of the project. Practitioners also stressed the need for initial pilots and small scale testing to, to meet the needs of girls with uh, intersecting identities in particular, and they really recommend including breathing spaces into curriculums and mid-course reflection. Um, on the uptake of trainings to, to take a pause, to reflect, to think about who's attending, who's benefiting, who's getting left out. And there's really many wonderful examples in the paper of how practitioners have done that and the kinds of adaptations that they have actually made to trainings. Um, the third finding is, um, is around mobilizing agents of change among and around adolescent girls. All the projects in the sample were multi-level interventions. And all practitioners stress that, that girls at this age need role models. Some felt that existing authority figures in their lives could be turned into role models, for example, caregivers, parents, teachers, whereas some felt that uh, creating role models outside the girls' regular environment uh, was more useful. And in this case, they really stressed the role of uh, the category of mere peers, um, you know, uh, youth football coaches, young community facilitators who are slightly older than the girls and perceived by girls as sort of uniquely positioned to relate to their sexual and social challenges and who are armed by the projects um, uh, with resources to guide them through those challenges. <clears throat> Excuse me. <clears throat> Practitioners also emphasize the need to create agents of change among girls themselves. And um, here, the, the importance of girl-led programming really came up quite strongly um, because it has the ability to restore dignity, give girls the capacity to aspire, encourage innovation. Uh, but they also pointed out to a lot of challenges that come up when doing girl-led programming. Um, one of the challenges being of maintaining the quality of the programming when doing peer-to-peer, -peer, when trying to scale up. And another uh, interesting challenge was just that adolescents were simply not being taken seriously uh, by adults across all contexts when they were trying to lead programs. Um, and this section in the brief is really full of, um, again, different models of girl-led programs, but also different models of youth-adult partnerships that have been tried and tested by practitioners to ensure that there's trust and respect towards young girls and boys as leaders and um, uh, trainers among communities. 
On the fourth key finding, um, and this is a really important one, all the projects offer really important lessons and insights on designing prevention programs in resource constrained environments uh, where services are either inaccessible to adolescents or just not youth friendly. Um, and I know we'll hear more on this from, from South Africa and from Serbia. And to overcome this challenge, different projects took, took um, different parts. So some practitioners developed a unified model uh, for providing assistance to young victims of violence um, by giving young activists a voice and seat at the table to push for more adolescent friendly services. Um, several also worked in partnership with other CSOs on creating an enabling environment for services uh, by pushing for policies, budgets, frameworks, implementation of laws, um, such that especially those who are at risk do not fall through the cracks. Um, so there's several examples in the brief of how these projects have brought services to girls or girls to services, and in some um, context really done this for the first time as first movers. And a notable example in the paper really is um, uh, a project from the State of Palestine Women's Studies Center that worked with uh, girls with disabilities in schools who are at risk of sexual violence and was able to institutionalize referral pathways for, for them for the first time in, in, in that context. Um, the final finding really is around that multi-level gender transformative programming. Um, all practitioners reiterated the importance of partnerships on this front um, across multiple types of organizations as being central for, for gender transformative programming. One really notable example from Nepal, um, where restless development trained adolescent girls, trained community leaders, traditional healers, and in parallel built the capacity of local uh, civil society organizations to really um, advocate and initiate campaigns for abolishing um, um, the harmful menstrual practice called Chopadi in, in, in Nepal. And this resulted in a really strong commitment at this more senior level within the governments so when it, it, you know, they allocated budgets, they drafted a bill. Um, and that high level commitment um, then really reinvigorated the commitment of peer educators at the grassroots level. Uh, so they were in turn sort of emboldened to, to continue doing their work. And that kind of iterative and multi-level collaboration is, is slow, but it's possible within a three year uh, framework and practitioners are just saying that it just isn't documented enough uh, that it when it comes to monitoring and evaluation they really want to see more adaptive and multi-level learning tools that can help to document this kind of change which is often deeply political can create backlash isn't linear but it can lead to gender transformative programming on the pandemic um, I, I won't spend too much time on it but um, it's, um, it, it's, it's, it, it, we will have a separate session on COVID-19 and its impacts on prevention programming on the 1st of March. So do join us then, but very quickly to say that of course all practitioners reflected on how difficult it's been to be working with this age group during the pandemic. Um, and while the impact of the new and recent wave is still sort of emerging, there was unanimous agreement that regardless of entry point being used, whether working through schools, uh, communities, there's been significant new risks of violence to that age group, significant delays in, in, in programming and sometimes suspension of programming, um, with CSOs being very concerned about the well being of girls, especially again at risk girls. And the brief has several group, uh, examples of the types of programming that practitioners have adapted to in light of the pandemic, doing more research, doing more advocacy and really visibilizing the issue when giving girls the platform and a seat at the table to make sure that COVID responses are adolescent friendly. Um, so building on these lessons, and uh, I'll be done in a couple more slides, uh, the brief has a concluding section with, with 10 key recommendations for practitioners, researchers, and donors. Um, the first recommendation that is coming from practitioners to practitioners is really considering safety audits up front um, to understand safety concerns in the immediate environments of adolescent girls. Safety audits are fairly common in, in prevention programs in humanitarian settings, and uh, there is an opportunity there to, to, um, uh, to leverage it more to allow organizations to assess and identify risk up, upstream. 
Um, informed by that initial analysis or safety audit, consider carefully who may be the best agents of change, whether it's going to be near peers, teachers, parents, or players, or some combination, with a very clear understanding of the risks of perpetration potentially from, from change agents themselves. Um, Co-produce prevention programming with adolescents to make it age appropriate and nuanced, um, to address resistance to any key messages, and finally, consider multiple entry points for engaging um, adolescents based on the form of violence being addressed and recognizing the continuum, continuum of violence. Recommendations for policymakers and donors are as follows. Um, develop iterative, adaptive learning systems, especially to meet the needs of those facing multiple and intersecting risks. Um, consider how to include an explicit recognition of the risk of perpetration of violence within prevention programs and foster partnerships and fund collaborative work between different types of civil society organizations all of who have that common goal of reducing violence against girls and may have different strengths in engaging adolescents and finally recommendations for researchers um, to conduct more research in collaboration with practitioners on designing prevention programs that work with a diverse group of adolescents uh, develop evaluation and learning tools that can really adequately capture gender transformative programming. Um, and finally, if and where research is needed and appropriate during the pandemic, continue to develop ethical ways of conducting research on violence against girls remotely and safely. Um, so I'll stop there. Thank you very much. I uh, just want to give a very quick shout out again to all the 10 organizations.